to be just sort of one of many genres. Uh, next image, please. <clears throat> There's an example of what uh, the early Superman strip looked like. Uh, next image, please. Superman's uh, enemies that used to be, or to start with, they were they were corrupt politicians, slum lords, uh, ward healers, uh, the people that vexed the common readers of the 1930s, um, the, you know, the common villains, and the the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the super-powered aliens from outer space and the super-scientists like Lex Luthor came along much later. And uh, Superman, <clears throat> to me, is sort of the, uh, the most anti-libertarian of the superheroes because he comes from the sky, he's sort of like a god, and he comes down to Earth in order to tell us how to live, right? And he's got these amazing powers that nobody else has. And, uh, and, and he's sort of like a wish fulfillment fantasy for New Dealers that had become frustrated with the inability of the New Deal to, to solve all the problems that it had set out to solve in the early 30s. Now, Batman's a little different. <clears throat> Batman came along a year later, and he's sort of a different kind of fantasy. He, to me, he's like um, a private protection service. You know, he was, he was a millionaire, so he had some money and capital, and he essentially set himself up as an alternative to the government in terms of, of solving crime and, and, and uh, protecting the innocent and vanquishing the guilty. And uh, those, those are the first, the, the left cover is the first appearance of Batman anywhere, and the right cover is the first Batman comic book by the time he teamed up with Robin in this sort of weird man-boy love thing. Uh, next image, please. Um, and then World War II happened. <clears throat> and that kind of scrambled everything up a bit because all the superheroes were essentially recruited to go fight the Axis. And then you had some new superheroes like Captain America created for the express purpose of fighting World War II. And you always wondered how that war lasted so long with all these superheroes going over and fighting Nazis, but you know, logic doesn't have to enter into it. Uh, next, uh, showing you examples of some of the other comics that were published in the, the 40s and 50s and showing the wide variety of genres that they used to have. Uh, they had horror and romance and juvenile comedy and teen comedy and and then Mad Magazine, which was sort of a genre onto itself, it, it did a lot of, it, it really started the, um, the, common, the, the commentary on popular culture sort of thing that, that so many other different kinds of people do today. Um, next, things, uh, there, there was such a, a wide variety of experimentation. There were a lot of comics that scared the older folks, and so the UN said it, convened a hearing called the Falver hearings that uh, were sort of like the McCarthy hearings but for comics. And uh, the, uh, the enormous amount of pressure was put on the comic book industry to clean up their act, so to speak, and, and with the threat of shutting them down. And so what the comic industry did was they, they put together this uh, Comics Code Authority that had a set of very rigid guidelines over what could be portrayed in comics. Uh, in, you know, and aside from the obvious, no drug use, no uh, kinky sex, uh, no image to the eye, no injury to the eyeball images. Uh, the the cops are always portrayed in the positive light. Uh, bad guys always lose. Uh, so it really put a straitjacket on the industry, and is probably the main reason why comics changed from a wide open kind of uh, medium into a very uh, stiltified medium where you really only had two genres, and one was superhero and the other was comedy, uh, humor. Uh, next image, please. Um, <clears throat> now, as far as I know, there were no libertarians working in comics up until fairly recently, but there was one that came close, and that was Steve Ditko, who was an objectivist, a, a devoted follower of Ayn Rand. Uh, objectivists insist that they are not libertarians, and I'm not going to argue with them. Okay, you don't want to be a libertarian. You don't have to be. It's, you know. uh, but <clears throat> he teamed up with Stan Lee and created Spider-Man. And Ditko, in, in those days, tried as best he could to explore moral questions and try to slide in his uh, objectivist theory kind of you know, in the background and, and subtly, and of course having to work with Stan Lee, who was a... Uh, unreconstructed New Dealer presented so much of a challenge that he wound up quitting after about a year and a half. Uh, next slide. But he did create some other heroes in comic books. Uh, created Doctor Strange for Marvel 
And in the middle, that's the question, which he created for an outfit called Charlton Comics that published in the 50s and 60s and early 70s and was later bought by DC. And uh, if you've seen the Watchmen movie, uh, the question was the origin, the original version of Rorschach. <clears throat> um, and on the right, uh, he created some work for DC, and there was that was the most interesting one called the Creeper. Uh, and you can, and the thing about Ditko was that he's remembered really more as being a stylist than as being a, a crazy philosopher. Uh, although he did uh, do some more philosophical work outside of mainstream comics. Next image, please. Uh, libertarians may have seen some of his Mr. A work, which was his most hardcore, straightforward, uh, black and white uh, uh, moral moral code. You know, expressing you know your basic objectivism 1.1.0. Uh, Avenging World was a uh, a magazine that he later had published that uh, collected some of his Mr. A stories and some other stories in a similar vein. They were very hardcore, straight up objectivist. Uh, next image. And I thought for a moment that I found an early comic book about Ron Paul, but uh, I was mistaken. Next image, please. <clears throat> so uh, looking at liberty in comics, <clears throat> there was a, a sort of a revolution in comics in the late 1960s when the counterculture came together in San Francisco and uh, some cartoonists wound up going up there and started publishing uh, so-called underground comics. Uh, Zap Number Zero was one of the first. And uh, the stories really ran a gamut from uh, political commentary to you know, social pointing out the foibles of uh, people in the counterculture and, and just weird... Um, psychological experimentation. Uh, my favorite from the era is, is Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers, uh, written and drawn by Gilbert Shelton, uh, concerning three uh, hippies that uh, were pretty hardcore potheads. And a lot of their stories involved uh, dealing with the cops or not getting caught by the cops or you know dealing with the various aspects of working in the black market. They were, some, they were like, like the first agorists, in a sense. Uh, next. Uh, and there's, and there's some more. Another uh, Gilbert Shelton comic was uh, a character called Wonder Warthog, who was a, a total send-up of the superhero genre. And uh, he uh, made fun of all the tropes common to those comics. And it was, if, uh, if you're familiar with the superhero genre, you should try to find one of those, and you'll laugh your ass off. But uh, Rip Off Press also published uh, other undergrounds covering various themes, including you know, re religion and sociology and and popular culture, and it was <clears throat> the first glimmering of what was later going to be an explosion of genres and comics. Uh, next image. Uh, here's an example of a, an unusual uh, mashup of genres, uh, uh, comedy and horror, uh, written and drawn by Batten Lash, who is a libertarian. Uh, he was uh, originally from Brooklyn, he uh, now lives in San Diego, and uh, he publishes Supernatural Law himself, and he uh, serializes it on the internet. Uh, and uh, also works uh, for Archie Comics as a writer, and also works for um, the outfit that publishes Simpson Comics. He does some writing and some illustration for them. Uh, next slide. Uh, <clears throat> the only really libertarian I know that works in mainstream comics is a fellow named Paul Pope. And he's done some independent work, like you see, with 100% there on the right. And he also has done some Batman comics for DC. So you can see an image up on the left. That's from Batman 100, which is set in a sort of a dystopic future where uh, uh, the police state is uh, even worse than it is now, hard as that might be to conceive. And uh, Batman still is still active and still working. And he has to spend more time running from the cops than he does chasing after the villains. Um, next image, please. Uh, yes. Did he have anything to do with the uh, Batman? Yes, he did. And I was trying to find an image for that, and, and I couldn't. But yeah, he did a story that was basically set in Berlin uh, during World War II, and involved uh, a, a sort of an earlier version of Batman saving the von Mises papers. Yeah, I have it. I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I was trying to find an image for that, and I, and I couldn't. But yeah, you know, Pope is a libertarian. He acknowledges publicly that he is, uh, but he keeps it in his pants most of the time. He's, he's uh, so to speak, he, 
he's really more of an art stylist and, and really focuses more on exploring uh, different aspects of storytelling and libertarianism is just a small part of, of what he's about. Next image, please. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, go back to the political side just a moment to give a shout out to Kevin Tuma, who is the only freelance libertarian political cartoonist I know besides myself. Uh, and he's uh, done a lot of work for uh, the Ron Paul people, and he's worked with James Hudnall. And uh, he does pretty good stuff most of the time. There's some things he does I don't agree with. But uh, he's, he's really gotten good at, at coming up with gags. You can see the toilet paper with Bill of Rights down the left and McCongress uh, supersizing himself again, and the two lobes of W's brain. And uh, it's, it's been... He's had a pretty good run. Uh, next image. Uh, <clears throat> another libertarian cartoonist, Peter Bagg, who uh, has had quite a few uh, comics published in Reason Magazine. Most of you that subscribe to Reason or check it out regularly were probably familiar with, with the, the stories. He tends to do two and three and four page uh, mini comic books within the magazine, discoursing on some topic or another in his, in his sort of unique view viewpoint. Uh, next image, please. But before he was in Reason, he was uh, part of the alternative comics revolution of the 80s uh, and started doing, uh, first he did neat stuff and then he did hate and then kind of alternated back and forth between those and, and started publishing those, uh, I believe, it might have been actually the early 1980s. And uh, was part of a larger revolution of, of independently produced comics that, uh, that you know, eschewed the comic co comics code, were not distributed on newsstands the way traditional comics were, and sort of set up their own uh, distribution and marketing network that regular comic books later piled onto when the newsstand market collapsed. Uh, next image, please. <clears throat> this is my first comic book. Um, I published, I got this published in 1986. And as far as I know at the time, this is, uh, the first uh, story of anarcho-capitalists merrily cruising through space, uh, robbing government spaceships kind of story that, that I've ever that I've seen published. I, I had two of these out. They were they were they came out during the, the so-called black and white revolution of the mid '80s, and when the black and white market collapsed, so did the publisher I was working for. Next image, please. <clears throat> and I've sort of set gamma to side. That was a that was a different one. There was uh, there was a a. a, a um, a, a fad that lasted about three years and I came in on the tail end on of uh, X-rated comic books that would still actually told stories. They weren't just about pornography, but you know, they actually had storytelling involved with them. And I came up with this idea of a, a young woman who was sort of a Heinleinian Friday type character, a young woman who was, had uh, transhumanist enhancements, so she was really fast and strong and could do amazing things. And this little robot cat it was her companion, and I wanted to call the book Cyber Pussy, but the publisher chickened out and went with Cyber Lust instead. Next image. So uh, I, uh, there really wasn't much going on in, in terms of liberty and comics again until uh, early in this decade. Um, I had met Neil Smith online actually back in 1977, and we uh, corresponded a bit. And uh, a mutual friend of ours suggested that we go in together and, and do a graphic novel adaptation of The Probability Brooch, which was his most successful novel. And uh, so I spent most of 2002 and part of 2003 shopping it around the different publishers and didn't have any takers. And then I found an angel investor that would start up a publishing company, Big Head Press, for the express purpose of making this real. Sideways in time to an alternate North America where the Whiskey Rebellion had gone the other way. And uh, as a result, uh, he finds himself in this strange world that looks sort of like the one he left, but is very different. There seems to be no poverty, almost no crime, almost no government. The great apes, uh, the chimps and the gorillas are considered people, as are the, the dolphins. And everyone that doesn't carry a gun prefers a sword. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's it's a great book. You know, wh whichever you know, whichever version you want to read, the, the the prose version has a lot more details in it than I had to cut. 
for length to, to make the graphic novel, but uh, the essentials of the story are still in the graphic novel. Uh, next image, please. <clears throat> and so from there we went to another collaboration, Roswell, Texas, which is set in an alternative Texas that had never joined the United States because David Crockett survived the Alamo. And he made sure that Texas would remain forever independent and free. And so you fast forward to 1947 where Texican President Charles Lindbergh Jr. gets word that a flying saucer was shot down near the far west Texas town of Roswell by Texas Air Militia pilot Eugene Roddenberry. And so he sends his uh, best friend, Wild Bill Bear, and three uh, rangers, Texas Rangers, to investigate. And they wind up in a kind of a, a chase with agents from other foreign powers uh, that are people that are actual historical persons, but they're in slightly different roles because history has changed. For example, the war is still going on in Europe in 1947. The Nazis are, 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 hadn't been defeated yet. They're still, and they had, they had conquered England. And so there's a British government in exile in Canada. And so the British government in exile in Canada sends T.E. Lawrence, and the United States sends Elliot Ness to go with him. And then the Republic of California, President for Life, Walter Elias Disney, sends his chief military advisor, Marion Michael Morrison, and, uh, who is better known by a different name in our universe, and I'll let you figure that one out. <coughs> and um, it's a wild romp of a story, and they're all in a race to get to Roswell first, and find the, the widow lady whose uh, ranch the saucer had crashed on and they want to get their secrets first because they figure that the, the technology will give them an advantage and what they find is something very different than what anyone expected. Uh, the images on the right are from Rex F. May who was a, a co-writer of Roswell but he's a cartoonist himself and he's been doing these little spot illustrations that have appeared in about a dozen different magazines from the Wall Street Journal to the old Saturday Evening Post to I think he's had a couple in Newsweek. Uh, he's had quite a number in Liberty Magazine, and uh, <clears throat> now he publishes them on the web and, and still gets them into a variety of different uh, websites. Uh, next image, please. Uh, Big Head Press also tried to get a little bit away from hardcore libertarianism, trying to find a wider market, and so we found Stephen Grant, who is a mainstream comics writer. He's written The Punisher and Justice League, and quite a few crime comics, and he had this idea for a redo of the Odyssey, in which uh, Odysseus, instead of capitulating to the gods in order to get home, he outsmarts them. And there are a lot of good libertarian themes in the book, which are kind of surprising coming from a fairly hardcore leftist. But uh, you know, the, the idea of, of the basic idea of owning your own life and controlling your own destiny is something that, that uh, he agrees with with us, and so uh, this was a theme that was explored in that. Uh, on the right is the cover for our next book, Phoebus Crumb. It's another Neil Smith collaboration. This is a, uh, a sequel to uh, uh, Henry Martin and Breda Martin. Uh, Phoebus was uh, Henry Martin's best friend, and he winds up getting commissioned to go off and, and destroy a uh, a dreadnought sailing ship that is, threatens the balance of galactic power. It's, it's mostly an adventure story with some philosophy thrown in. Uh, next image, please. <clears throat> Escape from Terra was, was, is an ongoing adventure strip. We discovered uh, publishing on the web that uh, strips seem to work a lot better than graphic novels because you get a small chunk of story and can get it up every day. And having a daily update really boosts your audience. So we, so we tried to... Uh, do an adventure strip sort of in the, in the tradition of Buck Rogers and uh, Terry and the Pirates, and we call it Escape from Terra. It's set 100 years in the future, where you have uh, uh, asteroid miners with a colony on Ceres, and is essentially an anarcho-capitalist culture with uh, competing money and, and competing uh, private justice, and you know, all, all the theoretical stuff that you might read about on Von Mises is actually explored as, as, as in a real or a realized kind of setting here. And uh, that's the cover for the first volume. We have almost enough material now for a second, and uh, we hope to continue this as long as we can. Uh, will be in that one? Huh? Will be in that one? You'll be in the second volume. You're, you're, you're like one of the, yeah, Dick Body. Um, when Sandy wrote a character called Reggie King, who is like a leading citizen and, and a bit elderly, uh, who plays a central role in the first story arc, what happens is the United World Government on Terra sends some agents to Ceres to try to establish uh, control of the place. 
and they don't really have any idea what's going on there. They don't have any idea that this, uh, Ceres is essentially an anarchy. And so they, they come up with a ruse, and Reggie King poses as King Reginald I, Lord Protector of Ceres and all the minor planets, and, uh, and deals with these agents, and then winds up uh, giving them a bill for all the stuff that the United World Government supposedly owns Ceres under the various treaties, that, you know, the Moon Treaty and some of the other treaties and, and, and laws that have been passed, and, and temporarily thwarts them that way. But it, 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 there's, uh, there are repercussions for that that come along a bit later, also related in the book. And uh, Reggie is, is, a, is an important character and is in a lot of the stories, not all of them, but a lot of them. And uh, he's going to be going through a change in the third volume. And you see, so you guys have to stick around for that. <clears throat> Next image, please. Now, I, this is not a libertarian comic. It's a comic about libertarians. And it, it points up uh, a problem that we have come to ha have to face. Um, when we started Escape from Terra and when we started uh, some of our other books, we wore libertarianism on our sleeve. And we thought that was the, the way to go because it worked for Robert Heinlein. I mean, he was pretty unabashed. He had a kind of a mix of adventure and sex and sermonizing. And it worked for him back in the 1960s and you know, through the rest of his career. But the problem is, thanks to the internet, <clears throat> or, or I should back up, back then, hardly anyone had heard of libertarian ideas, whether they had the label on them or not. It was all new and very fresh to them, and, and so people could accept them with more of an open mind. But now, thanks to the internet, just about everyone who is aware of politics at all thinks they know what libertarianism is. They usually have the wrong idea about it. And this cartoon, 24 Types of Libertarian, is a sort of an interesting reflection of how we seem to come across to other people. And I, I, I kind of cringe when I look at that because some of the people that I see in that cartoon are, are a little bit too real. Uh, you know, you know n none of us is perfect and we all have our quirks and the quirks are kind of magnified in some of that. And, and I think anyone that's into activism and into education and promotion ought to take a look at this. You can find it online pretty easily. Just Google for it. And uh, kind of take it as a lesson in feedback. You know, this is this is how we're getting perceived by uh, by the people that we're trying to convince. Uh, so, next image, please. <clears throat> I'm starting another project called Quantum Vibe. It's another adventure strip uh, that we're going to debut probably in December. Uh, science fiction, and the focus is going to be on the characters, and on the plot, and on the adventure with a bit of sex and a bit of uh, danger. And then I'm going to just kind of sneak the libertarianism in through all the interstices in between that stuff. So it's there in the background. Um, <clears throat> I find that when I look at fiction that has other points of view, the other points of view are there in the background and sort of assumed. And, it's, and it kind of insidiously reinforces the ideas of statism. So what I want to do is re insidiously reinforce libertarianism. And uh, that's, uh, that's where I'm hoping to go with this. And you guys are, are the first group of people outside of Big Head Press to see that image, because that's page one, which I just managed to complete before coming down here. Uh, and that's all I've got for my slideshow. Um, the, to conclude, basically, it's, it's, it's pretty thin in terms of liberty and comics. It's, it's just Big Head Press, really, and a few other uh, independent operators out there in Exhibit A Press, Bat and Lash. Uh, he does the same thing. He writes, he writes stories about courtroom drama combined with horror with, in a humorous vein, and then he slides a philosophy in kind of on the side where you're not being beaten over the head with it. And uh, The jury is still out as to how effective that is in terms of spreading the philosophy. Maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. It's hard to get feedback. But at least if you can keep their attention, there's a chance that you can uh, enlighten some people. And that's all I got. Where are we on time? Have I used it all up? I bring you a gift, Scott. Bring me a gift? Yep. <laughs> Are there any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I came a little bit late. I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on uh, the history of uh, liberty and comics in the 20th century outside of people who were overtly libertarian. There really wasn't much. I mean, the, the industry is dominated by new dealers. And uh, most people in arts generally, <clears throat> because of the kind of education they get, 
Uh, you know, the, the, the last stronghold of Marxism in the United States is in college departments of English. And you study early 20th century novels, you're going to get, you know, Sinclair Lewis and, and a lot of these other guys that were essentially either progressives or out and out Marxists. And it, it's had an influence on the culture. And uh, we all also know in retrospect that um, the Communist Party in Russia did actually work to try to infiltrate the, the, uh, the movie industry here and had some success in order to essentially suffuse our, our popular culture with uh, socialist themes. So <clears throat> we're only now just starting to fight back. Big Head Press is leading a charge. I uh, hope we can get some more support both from within the movement and from uh, fellow travelers to, uh, to, to, to show that this is, this is something that also needs to happen in addition to all the other work that we do. Yes? Yeah, it's like a, it's the Archie Bunker effect. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Judge Dredd was uh, created for uh, the British comic uh, 2000 AD. And yeah, he was supposed to be a parody of a hyper fascist uh, cop, uh, cop slash judge. That's why he's called Judge Dredd. He was, they, in, in the future, they have these guys with the helmets and the gear and all that stuff that go around in their flying cars beating up on perpetrators. And they are judge, jury, and executioner as well as cop. And uh, <clears throat> the idea was to parody and poke fun of uh, police statism. But then, as you said, he turned out to be a very popular character. And people started taking him to heart. And people started seeing him in a sympathetic light. So you've got to be careful when you do this stuff. Uh, next. It's a mixed bag. Um, some themes that they'll explore, like with the X-Men, they'll explore uh, minority alienation. You know, the, the X-Men are the mutants, and they're feared and reviled by general humanity because humanity doesn't really understand them and fears anything that's different. That's a, a sort of a pro-liberty theme that gets explored. Um, but most of it, uh, especially with superheroes, is, is, is pretty anti-liberty, or at least it's anti-market. Um, you know, heroes aren't supposed to be in for it to make money. They're supposed to be selflessly giving away their, of their time and their energy uh, you know, for the greater good. And uh, often you'll see a theme in these comics where some of them will get tired of helping other people and start trying to do for themselves, and things always go awry. They wind up being sorry that they tried because everything blows up in their faces. So, yeah, um, to the extent that libertarianism, ter libertarianism intersects with um, some leftish themes like personal freedom of personal expression um, and freedom of conscience, you'll see some themes in there. Um, but there really isn't much outside of that that I've seen. Anyone else? Yes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned Superman, and uh, sure, the uh, it, it's kind of like the Soviet, you know, the policeman that's twenty stories tall. I think they have a similar uh, cartoon character to represent the state. But uh, there is a. The, I think one of the early comics, uh, he was taken in isolation as a physician. That there was a British villain trying to get us into World War Two. I don't remember that. Or, I'm not familiar with that story. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, America was very much divided on the war on Europe before Pearl Harbor. Uh, and of course, um, there, were, there were quite a few German Americans, and not just of not just of immigrants, but you know, I'm one too. Uh, and so there was a lot of there was as much sympathy for Germany uh, prior to both wars uh, as as as. You know, as much prior to World War II as there was prior to World War I. And it wasn't until the attack that, uh, you know, just like the 9-11 attack kind of produced a seismic change in our politics, uh, Pearl Harbor did the same thing back then. And uh, later on, but, you know, there were, uh, well, first of all, you had the storyline of him coming to Kansas and being raised by the Kansas family. 
Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Well, in 70 years, there's been a lot of variations on the theme. But the core of Superman and his origin was that uh, he, he came from the heartland, even though he was an alien. He's an illegal alien, right? But he grew up in the heartland. <clears throat> And he, he developed Heartland values, that is, uh, down on the farm, uh, common man, you know, kind of sympathies, as opposed to the evil industrialists and the evil uh, slumlords and the, the corrupt city politicians that he was fighting in the early issues of the comic. And then after World War II, he, that kind of changed and he became more um, established. He became an establishment figure as opposed to uh, an alternative to the establishment uh, wet dream. You have to be very good uh, in order to get anywhere. I don't know if I'm good enough. I, I, you know, I keep working on it. I keep trying to up my game. Um, you have to kind of decide early on how you want to approach it. There's, there's two routes. One is to try to go work for the big two, in which case you need to read a lot of their books and kind of understand the kind of stories they're looking for, the kind of art style they're looking for. Uh, if you're an artist, it's a bit easier to get in because uh, you can show a portfolio to someone in about five minutes and they can judge whether you've got the, the skill. Uh, if you're a writer, then you have to show scripts and it takes longer to read a script and editors are usually very busy people. <clears throat> but uh, if you want to work for the big two, read a lot of their books, go to the big conventions, uh, try to find time to talk to editors. Don't expect to be able to show them a script if you're a writer, but at least talk to them and find, and find out what kind of stories they like or what they're interested in. And, and right to that market. Um, <clears throat> of course, you'll wind up doing a lot of establishmentarian stuff, and you won't be able to, uh, you know, put in any kind of radical politics unless you're really clever, really good at being sneaky. Um, or you can go the independent route, which is what I've done, and I like it because I own my stuff. Uh, I don't do work for hire, uh, at least not in comics, and. Um, I, you know, so I so I have full control over the stories that I create. Of course, the problem with that is I don't have the distribution and marketing that the big two have, and so it's an uphill battle just trying to get noticed and, and trying to get my books out. So, <clears throat> and if you want to go that that route, again, go to the conventions and talk to people that are in the business and find out uh, you know the particular problems that they faced and how they've dealt with them. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you uh, uh, raise money for your uh, books, or do you just uh, get them strictly by sale? Well, we uh, we serialize everything on our website. We get a little bit of advertising revenue, uh, and then we sell the books. <coughs> In our case, um, we have an angel investor who sunk quite a lot of money into uh, keeping my lights on and my mortgage paid while I do all this work. Uh, there are other uh, independent artists that will work uh, day jobs and then do this in their spare time while they build up their jobs and build up their audience. There's different routes and you know, I'm, I'm kind of lucky to have found my angel investor. A lot of people don't. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you, know, you, you find one, if you want to do it badly enough, you find a way. Hmm? Well, he has to pay me enough that I can stay alive while I do this stuff, and then he has to pay for printing costs. He has to pay the bandwidth fees on the website, uh, and he has to pay for promotional expenses, like whenever I travel to a convention, you know, pay for my hotel. It's I don't want to give a dollar figure because that's kind of proprietary information, but it's it's not small. It's it's easily in the the five figures over time. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess I'm done. Um, 
Stick around for Pasha Roberts, who will be coming up. I guess he's the next speaker. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> Give me my mic, man. Yeah. <laughs>